So I think that's the only announcement that I have. There you go. So Luke chapter 5, 12, we're going to go through 12, verse 12 through 26. We've got a lot of ground to cover uh, in these verses here. And I entitled the message, uh, The Message in the Miracles, because we're going to see a series of miracles happening here. We've already seen one with Peter, and I broke up this uh, chapter by three parts. So we did the first part last week, we'll do the first, uh, second part this week, and God willing, and I think we're going to do the third part next week, unless the Lord has me break that down even further, but I don't think so. So the message in the miracles, Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 26. And before we get started, let me pray again. Father, thank you for this day that you've given to us, Lord. Thank you for this time. And Father, I set aside, we set aside, all of our cares and all of our concerns, Father. All of our doubts, all of our fears, everything, Lord, that occupies our minds and our hearts. We want to set aside right now, Lord, and spend time listening to what your spirit has to say to your church. I pray, Lord, that any words of mine would be wiped away, Father. If this message doesn't even want to be taught by you, Lord, that you would delete it. Any words, Father, wipe them away. Prepare our hearts, Lord, and may I not make you look foolish. May I not make myself look foolish. Help me to remember everything that you've placed on my heart, Lord, to put down in words, Father. And we just praise you for this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the message of the miracles. The word miracle is from the Latin word miraculum, and it, and it means uh, something that evokes wonder. It, it, it is a word that appears to violate natural laws, right? And at the same time, it reveals God to the eye of faith. There are four words in the Bible that describe miracles. We see signs, we see wonders, works, and power. And they have definitions. A sign speaks of a miracle that carries a message with it. A wonder focuses on the effect of that miracle. Because they can cause awe, and they can cause wonder in people, and they can also call, cause terror in people. And a work, and a work of power, focuses on God's strength and his ability to perform that miracle. And think about this. The same power that is used for miracles is the same power that God used to create the world from nothing. That same power that's in him, the Bible says, is in us. And if we can believe that by faith, then we have no problem believing in miracles, and we have no problem believing in God's power. We have no problem believing that Jesus came down to die for our sins. We have no problem believing that he got up on that cross, and that he rose on the third day and ascended into heaven and is coming back for us. We have no problem with that. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12 tells us, what? That, that God measures the waters in the hollow of his hand and the heavens with the span of his hand. And the hollows of his hand speak of the palm. Now the water, water on the earth is what? Over 70%? And think about that in the palm of his hand. And the span, you guys know this, the span, pinky to thumb, stretched out. That's the heavens to the Lord. Just goes to show how big he is. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 says, Heaven is my throne and earth my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? I'm too big for you. You can't do it. You can't provide me a home. For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. What a beautiful picture. He's so big, he's so vast, and yet he says, but I will look on those people who are humble and who seek me and who tremble at my word. Matthew Henry wrote this, all created beings shrink to nothing in comparison with the creator. 
When the Lord by his spirit made the world, none directed his spirit, none gave advice what to do or how to do it. The nations in comparison of him are as a drop which remains in the bucket compared with a vast ocean or as the small dust in the balance which does not turn it compared with all the earth. This magnifies God's love to the world that though it is of such small account and value with him, yet for the redemption of it, he gave his only begotten son. Think about that, how vast he is. And yet we think, oh, we've got it all together. Oh, we don't need God. In the book of Jeremiah, you can see that in chapters one and two, where it talks about the leaders, it talks about them going off on their own, saying, who is God? We don't need him. Today, we're gonna see faith in who Jesus is and not just what he can do. And that's important. We're going to see seeking Jesus on behalf of others, carrying other people towards the Lord. And we'll see messages in the miracles. So let's start at verse 12 of chapter 5. And we'll read to verse 15. And it says this, And it happened when he was in a certain city, that behold, a man was, who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Jesus is always willing to work on our behalf, isn't he? He's always willing to help take care of our needs so that his name can be glorified. How do we know that? 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says what? You guys know this. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Okay, so now combine that with Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. In the New Living Translation, it talks about uh, keep on asking, keep on seeking. It's a continuous thing. Don't just ask for it once, continue. When we truly see Jesus, we recognize who we really are and who he really is. We realize and recognize our sin as we humbly <coughs> approach Jesus. I mean, remember the reaction of Peter, right? When he saw that miracle that Jesus did in front of him, and he realized how small he really was in comparison to Jesus, and what did he do? I'm not worthy to be here. When he filled that boat full of fish, this shouldn't be happening right now. I'm fishing at the wrong time and in the wrong spot. And look at the miracle that the Lord did. I am in front of greatness, and it humbled me. When we're willing to lay down our sin and our lives, the Lord is willing to forgive and to heal and to pick us up. And this is what we begin to see happening in this man full of leprosy. It tells us that Jesus is in a certain town now, right? Probably still in the region of Galilee. And we're introduced to this man who is not just has leprosy, but he's full of it. It's a severe case of leprosy. It's This leprosy is a chronic infectious disease that has sores and scabs and white shining spots beneath the skin and if left untreated limbs begin to fall off if you guys go and google this stuff you can see the deformity that it has it's still out there today it's called hansen's disease and it was common during the time of jesus and the bible does not give any clear indication that there was a cure and it was not curable and it's still not curable, but it is treatable. It's still not curable, but it is treatable. But they believed, and the Bible implies, 
that leprosy can only be healed by a miracle. How do we know that? If you take notes, you can write down 2 Kings 5, 7, where it says, uh, Jehoram said, Am I a god to kill and to make alive? That this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? They understood that nobody could heal anybody of this disease. There was no cure. So this man full of leprosy would understand something. He would understand that there's no cure for him of this disease. And that begins to give you the setting, doesn't it? That begins to give you where this guy's mind and heart may have been at this time. The hopelessness. Leviticus 13, 45 through 46. The law required that these people be isolated from the rest of society so that it would not be spread. And while excluded from society, lepers were required to wear clothes of mourning. They were required to leave their hair in disorder and when they're walking down the street to cry unclean, unclean, people would avoid them. And it gives you a picture of, again, what this poor guy was, was thinking about and what he might have been going through. I mean, think about it, right? If he was married before he caught it and had kids, no more holding your children, no more touching them, no more staying with them, no more holding of your wife, right? None of that. And not only that, society, you were a cast out and you had to walk around deformed and <coughs> ugly. And in the Bible, leprosy many times represents sin. We see that in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, and it gives us a picture of that. Leprosy representing sin. So he is ceremonially unclean and if he broke the law of touching anybody or reaching out to anybody, he could be killed. So think about this guy, right? He is unclean. Leprosy is a sign of sin in our lives. It's untreatable or uncurable, but it's treatable. And today I think about that as, as sin begin, becomes more... Um, open as even Jeremiah talks about you guys don't even hide your sin anymore it's so open it's so open now it's it's curable sin is curable now you accept the Lord but what do we do we treat it and how do we treat it we call it by another name or we say oh we have to love everybody well we do love everybody but that's just a disguise to say well you hate me if you don't agree with me so we disguise the sin. We treat it in a way where it's disguised rather than curing it. And we disguise it with different things. We relabel. So this man, think about him now. He's so desperate that when he sees Jesus, he could be killed if he goes to him, can't he? That's what the law says. But he's willing to break the laws of tradition for salvation in Jesus. It's like those religions that say, well, my religion doesn't allow me to do that. So I can't do that. But when we see Jesus, man, that outweighs everything. And we need to be willing to step out and do that. And he falls down and he implores Jesus, it tells us. In the Greek, that is the word deoma. It means to desire, to petition, or to beg. And this man was begging. He knew he had something going on, and he knew he needed to be changed. And we're going to see a contrast in the next man, but this man knew he needed a change. He was at the end of his rope. He finally came to the end of himself. And very often, this is where Jesus brings us before we fall before him. And if you haven't been there yet, you will be, because Jesus wants every piece and every part of our lives and those little things that are going in our in our heart that we know that we have to give to him he's going to come after those things as well and we're going to be brought to the end of our rope that's when we fall before him and he says lord if you are willing 
And what a great way to come before the Lord. It's like the heart of that person in Isaiah chapter 66 that we talked about at the beginning. It's a great way to come to the Lord in a heart of repentance. And he says this, Lord, if you are willing, because he already believes that the Lord can do it. Lord, if you're willing, I know you can do it, but if you're willing to do it. Of course Jesus is willing to do it. And what does Jesus do that's defiling? He steps out of everything, all of that religion, and he touches this man. The man implored Jesus according to Jesus' will, right? Lord, if it's your will, we ask that you would do this. And that's the best way to pray. Lord, these are the things happening in our lives. Would you please take care of those things if it's your will? If not, teach me the lessons that I'm supposed to learn in this situation. Help me not to gripe and complain all the time. Help me to learn because, Lord, I know one thing. You're in control of all of these things. I am not. So this man asked, right? And we have to ask. If the Lord is willing, he will do it. And if he's not, that's okay too. Because what can we learn in the lesson? He asked. It was answered. Jesus here breaks religious tradition too, right? He reaches out to him, and he reaches out to us as well. And immediately this guy is cleansed. Immediately. There's always that opportunity for the Lord to save a life at the very end. And we remember the sinner on the cross with Jesus at the very end. All those years... And he's hung up on the cross and he realizes something. Jesus shouldn't have been there and he should. And he says, hey, Lord, can I be with you? Yes, you can. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Immediately he was cleansed. Immediately this guy is, is cleansed. Now, something we need to clarify about miracles and healings. Because there's no recipe for this. And why do I say that? Because there are those who will have an event, they'll tell everybody to come out, and they do it in a specific way every single time. And sometimes they say it works and some, sometimes it doesn't. But there's no recipe. How do we know this? Turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. At verse 11. And in Luke 17, verses 11 through 14, it says this. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he <coughs> entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourself to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. You see the differences there? Jesus is far off. Those guys are far off. He doesn't touch them. He just says the word. And as they're walking away, then they're cleansed. There's no recipe. God can do it. He's diverse, right? Man, just when we think we got him in a box and we know how he works, he does something else. And we have to remember that all the time. He doesn't work in our little world that we paint. It's not paint by numbers. He does everything on his own way, in his own time. Then we see what? We see uh, Jesus telling the man not to tell anybody. Now this is a command. It's a military command. And when Jesus commands, we have to be obedient. So this miracle carried a message. And he wanted the message to be delivered in a certain way. Not in the way that the man wanted to deliver it. He wanted it delivered in a certain way. Well, how? You know, he's, he was to be examined. And uh, to bring the prescribed offering explained in Leviticus chapter 14, verse 4. Now you have to remember, this was an incurable disease, right? It was full blown. And he was completely cured of it. So when he presented himself to the priest, nobody had ever gone to the priest 
to say, I'm going to give you this offering now because I was cured of leprosy. Don't you think those priests would have been like, what just happened? But because they were so callous, nobody thought about it. They were so callous, there was, there was nothing that happened. Amazing. So it's incurable. They're so callous, they don't see any change in the man. And what happens in this whole scenario? What, what happened in, this, in Leviticus 14.4? Well, they were to bring two doves, right? One was to be killed, the blood poured into a basin with water. The other dove dipped into that water and blood and let free. And the, the drippings off of that dove were to represent that he was cleansed. That was the representation. And everybody would have known that. The Lord wanted them, the Lord wanted that to be shown and demonstrated. Why? Because then they would probably believe that Messiah was really here. But it also shows something else. It also shows the callousness of the people's hearts. And when there's unbelief, there's not a lot of miracles. So he was to be examined. We shouldn't always have to say anything, right? People should see the changes in our lives. The Lord doesn't always want us to be pounding at people, preaching Christ to them, even though we're supposed to proclaim the gospel. But we should, they should see the changes in our lives. And if they're not seeing the changes, then you question whether they know the Lord or not. I know somebody who tells me all the time, I hope you see the changes in me. I hope you see the changes in me. And I never see the changes in that person. Why should you always have to say that over and over? Demonstrate it. Because it's not believable. 1 John 3.18 says, let us not love with words or speech, but with what? Actions and in truth. So word about him spread. Word about Jesus spread. How could it not? Others probably spread the word, right? And once the news spread, multitudes began coming in to be healed. They began coming to him to be healed. So this man full of leprosy and disease... There was no hope for him. There has never been anyone cured from it that he knew of. He was deformed. He was ugly. He was isolated. And of course he would be open to being cured. His heart was prepared for Jesus. And then what? He sees Jesus. He risks everything. Leaves his old life to cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, if you are willing. And Jesus says, I am willing. And we have to be brought to that place. Full-blown sin in our lives eventually deforms us. And sin without uh, Jesus is like leprosy left unchecked. Even as believers, right? Even those little sins that we think we can get away with. It spreads and it affects and it isolates us. And where we're on the state of hopelessness... What is our response when we see Jesus in front of us? Do we try to cover and disguise it? Or do we reach out to him, implore him, and ask for his willingness to heal? Do we give it to him? It's the little sins, isn't it? James 1.15 says, But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is lured away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. That's why we have to take our thoughts captive. That's why we have to bring our bodies into submission. That's what the Bible tells us, putting on that full armor. So going to verse 17, we see this man of leprosy. Verse 17 now, we see something else. And it says, now it happened on a certain day. As he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop, let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. 
And when he saw their faith, he said to them, Men, your sins are forgiven you. Jesus does not need our help, does he? He doesn't need our help. He does not need us, but he wants to use us. We get the privilege of leading others to Jesus, but how often do we take that opportunity? Think about it. When is the last time in your mind that you can remember that somebody kept, came to the Lord through your ministry? Salvation was accomplished on the cross and the need for it is prompted by the Holy Spirit. But very often though, God uses us to make that introduction, doesn't he? So here we find Jesus teaching once again, this time in a house full of people. And this setting is a little different because it tells us that now we have Pharisees and teachers of the law here, and they're from all over the place. They're from every city in the region, Judea and, and Jerusalem. And think about that. That's 204 cities at this time. And there's somebody there from every city. There were hundreds of religious elite there listening to Jesus. And what do you think they were doing? You think they were there saying, Oh, what is he going to say? I'm so excited. No, they were there critically, ready to catch him in a lie. Why? Because he was a disruptor. He was disrupting their whole program, and they didn't like it. Their presence would have been good if their intention was right, but it wasn't. Why? Because it was their responsibility to ensure no false teachers would come in. It would be right for them to inspect Jesus. And you know, we do see that. I'm going to read it to you right now in Deuteronomy 13. But, well, let's read that and I'll get to the point. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5 says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or wonder, the sign of wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. So they're commanded to test the prophets to see if they're accurate or not. Well, that we have to be very careful with that because we're given that responsibility too. Right? We are. And I'm guilty of this myself. But we can become very critical of other people's ministries, of other pastors out there. We can become very critical of them. I've seen it over the years. I've done it myself. And we have to be very, very careful that when we are looking at the fruit of somebody's life, that we're not inspecting them so critically that we tear them down. Now, there are ministries out there that shouldn't be out there. And you'll know the difference. And you can pray against those things. But we have to be careful with that. So these guys were there to be critical of Jesus. Then, it tells us then that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now that's interesting, don't you think? So the power of the Lord isn't always around to heal? Well, yeah, the power of the Lord is always present. Well, let's take a look at something Let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. It's very interesting here. Matthew chapter 13, verses 57 and 58. And starting at verse 57, it says, So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own town. Now, he of their unbelief. No power. No power shown there because of their unbelief. But there's power present here. Why? Probably because a lot of hearts were ready to be changed at that time. The oppression that was happening, the depression that was taking place. So here now is a man who's paralyzed, it tells us. He has palsy, right? It's different from the man who had leprosy. How so? Because that man realized at that time, man, I've got no hope. You know? 
There's nothing else I can do. And his heart was ready and prepared. But this one is carried. I don't know that he realizes that he needs Jesus yet, right? He's being carried. I mean, he, he may, maybe not. We don't know. But these friends here loved him enough as we see them being carried and digging into the tiles. They love him to, enough to seek Jesus on his behalf. Now, Jesus intercedes for us, right? He intercedes for us. We're told that, Hebrews 7, 25. We ought to pray for our friends, and we ought to carry them to the Lord as well. We should do that. At first, these men cannot get in because of the crowd, and that does not hinder them, right? Think about this scene. How often do we, do we give up so easily? But think about the scene here. They can't get in because of the crowd, so they look for another way. And I was uh, listening, and Pastor Raul was talking the other day about a story about um, a man that he's been trying to minister to for 20 years. And he said finally he got the opportunity. It's one of his neighbors. And he ran into him in a store. And Pastor Raul, one way he gets in is he makes salsa for people. And he takes it to them. And so he did that for his neighbor. I guess he went around and gave it to his neighbor. Runs into this guy in the store and says, hey, I love the salsa. Can you make me more? Yeah, he said he went home that night to make some, to go over to minister the next day to that guy because he wants to tell him that Jesus loves him and he died for him. Taking every opportunity. A pastor of a huge church still at it. And on that same day, it was neat. It was last Tuesday. I had talked to the lady at the post office in Walnut she, I was wearing a Harley shirt one day, and she asked me if I rode, and her, her and her husband ride, and I had told her, hey, you know, I have some helmets, extra helmets I don't even use anymore, and I, I said I'd bring one in for her, and I did. On that same day that Pastor Raul told that story, I went in there with a helmet, and no, if you know that post office, it's always busy, but this time it wasn't, and all of the ladies were at the counter, and even their supervisor was in the front. And I brought it, and I brought it with a flyer for our church. And I said, hey, here's that helmet I told you I'd give you. And I said, by the way, I'm a pastor. Here's where our church is at. Please come. And they were all there listening and involved in the conversation. And was it a little embarrassing? Yeah, it's a little hard sometimes. I get it. But we have to be willing to take that opportunity. We should not care about how they think and feel about us, but how they think and feel about our Lord. That should be the only thing that matters. I don't care anymore. It's time to get crazy for the Lord. There was power present and there was belief in Jesus to do it. But he doesn't heal him physically at first, right? He heals him spiritually. Why? He heals him and he says, hey, your sins are for." Are forgiven you. Was he there for that? Did he know he was there for that? He was thinking to himself, I want to be healed of, I can't walk, I can't do anything. But did he realize he needed salvation first? And maybe at first he didn't know he needed to be forgiven of his sins. Many do not know this already. Many don't know this now. And we have to carry them to the Lord sometimes, don't we? In prayer, in intercession, those people that don't know the Lord, we can't always push them. We can't always do that. We can pray for them, though. Isaiah 65, 1 says, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am. Here I am. It's like Jesus standing on the door, at the door and knocking. You see, God was telling the children of Israel, hey, you're not listening? This is going to go out to the Gentiles. That's what he meant. People that didn't ask for me, and people who weren't seeking me, I'm going to make myself known to them. And that's what happens today, doesn't it? People aren't seeking the Lord. They're not asking for him. But maybe they don't realize they need him. And we're supposed to carry those people. Look what kind of friends these guys are. I was talking to, um, well, I'll get to that point in a minute. 
So these friends, this is what we see in this section here. They brought the paralyzed man to the Lord, and they were persistent. Jesus healed the man after he saved him. And there are those who do not even know they need the Lord, and God's trying to get an introduction with them through us. Sometimes that introduction takes sweat and tears and effort, and it's uncomfortable, like going in and saying, hey, here's a flyer, you know, to my church. That's uncomfortable. But what kind of friends are we if we just give up? You know, salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit, but God gives us a part in it, doesn't he? To open our mouths, to speak. Are there people in your life that you're making intercession for, that you're praying for, those that you started to carry to Jesus? Who are those people? Have you given up on them? Are you still doing it? Or did you hit a roadblock or a crowded room and give up? Or are you going to get into that tile and dig? Did you start off in tents? And now it's more like, yeah, God, you know, so-and-so, yeah, lift them up to you. And then dig off. It used to be that deep prayer that you had for them. I was talking to somebody the other day. This person is a leader in a church. A leader in the church. God's not going to show up if there's a lot of unbelief. Why would he? Right? There has to be belief. This person's a, a, a leader in the church. And we were talking. I was sharing with them about a person that we both know. That I've been praying for. That I continue to pray for. And this leader in the church tells me, oh, they're never going to go to church. What kind of faith is that? That person should not be in leadership. What kind of heart and attitude is that? Blows me away. Wasn't anybody from here? <laughs> but they shouldn't be in it. They shouldn't be in leadership. If you're in leadership and you don't believe somebody can get saved, I mean, it blew me away. No wonder why the church is declining. Pastor Ron was just talking about that in his church. No wonder why churches is, are declining. He said that he doesn't believe that that church is going to be as big in a few years. That's going to dwindle. Because there's so much unbelief. So why would Jesus show up if there's so much unbelief? But there was power there at this time. But there's not always, like when Jesus was in Nazareth. But what kind of people are we as Christians if we forget about this power? It's not easy. We know that. I love Psalm 126, 6, and it gives me just this great picture. It says... Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing a trail of seed, will surely return with shouts of joy, carrying sheaves of grain. And I've quoted this before. You go out with tears. It's labor. It's not easy. But where are you storing your treasures? Is it here? I mean, that seems like all we live for anymore, even in the church. You see it. We come to verses 21 through 26 now. And then going back to 20, let's say, <clears throat> when he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can for forgive sins but God alone? Now to reason here, is back and forth evaluation. It's debate, right? It's one confused mind debating with another confused mind. That's the picture. Matthew Henry, again, I quote him, says, It is to them as a tale told them, not a message sent to them. That's the way they were viewing it. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Hello? That's what he was trying to show. That's what he's trying to demonstrate. I am God. It goes on, verse 22. But when Jesus perceived, so he recognized, right? He knew their thoughts. He answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, rise up and walk? Well, 
Let's answer that question together. Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you is easier to say. Why? Because nobody can peer into your heart and see that. Only the Lord can, but you can't physically see that, right? But he goes on, but that you may know that the Son of Man, now stop there. Son of Man is an Old Testament reference to the Messiah. And so he's saying, they're saying only God can forgive sins. And he's saying, I am the Son of Man. And he's like, hey, I'm right here. I'm telling you, I'm Messiah. I have forgiven him of his sins, but because you don't believe, I'm going to have him stand up and walk now. And he's been given power on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. The miraculous carries a message. And it not only carries a message for the person being healed of sins and but it also carries another message, and it exposes the callousness of other people. And we're going to see that more and more as the time gets closer, aren't we? And then it says they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear. You see the cause of the miracle? It's what we've been talking about. Saying, we have seen strange things today. So Jesus deals with their questioning, right? And it's okay to question, but how were these men questioning? What was their attitude? They were just hanging around to find him saying something wrong. They tuned out and were looking for something specific. They were looking to change his words. They were looking into his words. They weren't waiting for his words to come out and change them, right? That's the difference. In this setting now, I believe we see another miracle carrying a message, which we already talked about. And just as it may have pointed out the callousness in the hearts of the priests who saw the leper present himself, I think it was, again, a message to that religious elite. What Jesus heals in the life of one person, we think sometimes should, should uh, just blow up and everybody be amazed about it, right? Like, I get so excited when I see things happening here. But not everybody does. Not everybody does. I understand that. And that's okay. But it convicts one person and exposes the sin in the life of another. One repents, one does not. Even though they see the same Jesus present, presented to them. And it's a matter of the heart. And we have to allow the Lord to come in and change our lives. What a beautiful picture. You know, I just wanted to reference uh, real quick in Jeremiah. You can turn there if you want. Uh, Jeremiah, I think chapter 1, yeah. Chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 1 at verse 17 says, Therefore prepare yourself and arise, and speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. He goes on to say in um, chapter, give me a moment. Oh, chapter 2, verse 7, it says, I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness, but when you entered, you defiled my land, made my heritage an abomination. And listen to this in verse 8. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. He tells Jeremiah in verse 17, chapter 1, to prepare himself, do all that he's commanded, but not to be dismayed before their faces, lest he's, lest, you know, or the God will, God will dismay him. But isn't it interesting, and you see it in what we just read, that he's accusing the leaders, right? 
of turning away. The writers of the law, the people who preached it, there was no power, there was no unbelief. I mean, there was no belief, so there was no power. And if we have people, like I described earlier, in ministry, then what's the point, right? Our hearts have to be changed even in the church. So it starts with you guys. It starts with us here, not just the leaders. You get the point? You know what I'm saying? Man, we're going to die out if we don't take this seriously. If we don't take it seriously and remember that he's coming back soon. Why do we have communion? We need to remember that the, Lord, the Lord's return is imminent. Have we forgotten? I feel like we've forgotten. I feel like the more years pass, the more people forget. And I can't wait for the Lord to return. Because how many more people are going to be falling away? Is that your heart? Because if it's not your heart as a Christian, it should be your heart as a Christian. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray, God, that I communicate it effectively, Lord. I know what you placed on my heart. I, I hope it came out correctly, Lord. Lord, your word does not come back void, Father. So I pray, Jesus, that you would touch hearts and that our will would be bent to yours and that we'd be willing to turn over our lives to you and that you would spark that fire within us, Lord, to not care what other people think, to not get bogged down with sitting and, and doing nothing and watching movies and loafing around and having our own free time. Lord, it's not time for that. Those days are done. We need to get in our hearts that there's hard work coming. And we have to sow in tears. And if we're not willing to do that, then what's the point? And we pray, God, that we don't do it in our own strength, that you give us the strength through the power of your Holy Spirit, that dunamis power that would fall upon us, Lord. And wherever we walk, wherever we go, may there be so much belief in us, Lord, in you, to ask you if you are willing, and may you say, I am willing. And may there be miracles, Father. There should be. And it's not just miracles of signs and wonders. It's people's lives changing. And Lord, if we are leaders in the church, if there are leaders in the church, we pray them out. We pray those ones out who think that somebody's so beyond that they can't be saved. Lord, take them out of ministry. They shouldn't even be there. And replace them. Replace them with those people, Father, that have a heart for you with reckless abandon. Remind us, Lord, that you are coming soon. And that's what we proclaim. And may that be the desire in our hearts to tell other people so that they can go with us. We pray these things now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.